it means that there is a great religious renewal that is sweeping over the nation. And yet, the Daily News chronicles more sordid details of debauchery and duplicity and dishonesty in the life of a nation. And we see paraded before us hate crimes, mass shootings. Polls show that there is a decrease on the impact of Christian conviction upon decisions that we make as individuals and as a society. Does that contradiction disturb you? In a dark moment, one might then ask of the Christian faith, so what good is it? The common lectionary, which is used as a guide to many churches, including ours for the most part, for a systematic reading of scripture throughout the year, has us read passages from the Gospel of John in this time between uh, the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. And in the latter chapters of John, and that's where we are right now, the passages recount the farewell discourse at that last supper that Jesus and the disciples heard, had together. For some three years, Jesus had been physically present with the disciples, but the cross would end that presence. With his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus knew that the world of these close followers was about to collapse. Their hopes would be shattered. Their faith would be tested. Now, the resurrection would provide a brief time of reunion, but the time would come that Jesus would be gone physically for good. And we read these words at a time when in the Christian year we are preparing for the coming physical absence of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday is Ascension Sunday and that's when we uh, remember that time when Jesus physically was removed from the earth. So what Jesus told them now must sustain them through some difficult and some frightening times. Although he is physically leaving, he promises to be present in a different way as they walked into this uh, uncertain future to live this new life that they had determined to follow. And we'll understand more about it if we take a closer look at what Jesus had to say. Now the trouble is that many people today are insulted and they're put off by the notion that we ought to study and dig, that we ought to read and reflect in order to be better Christians. Religion should be a matter of the heart, they say. It's not a head trip, it's a soul trip. The trouble with you preachers is that you always are trying to make the simple, heartfelt, straightforward religion of Jesus to be complicated and complex. Well, the thing is that from what I have observed as a pastor, this talk about simple faith and childlike trust Religion totally from the heart and not complicated by the head. That tends to be the first victim when life gets tough. It's not so much that incomprehensible sermons make Christianity different to figure out, difficult to figure out, but it is when you lay life next to Christian claims that we get into a kind of intellectual muddle. A personal tragedy, a natural disaster, some new evidence of human ugliness raises its head and we're begin, then we begin to think theologically whether we're ordinarily inclined that way or not. 
Anytime that life makes us ask why, or for the Christian, why God, then you are on your way to rep wrestling with some of these deepest dilemmas of life. So Jesus gave us the resources of the Christian faith as his disciples as he gave to his original disciples. For those times when life gets complicated, and when life began to raise some questions within us. The first of the resources he mentions, of course, is love. And you say, wait a minute, no, that was last week's sermon. You talked about love all the way through it. Well, we are in the same discourses as we read the scripture. And Jesus didn't talk about it just once. In fact, whenever we turn to the gospel, love is the common bond between God and Christ and disciples. The motivation for a life well lived is not primarily, if we use the early stages of faith stage development, it's not primarily fear, which is the old revival, uh, frontier revivalist method, Fear of eternal damnation, you better straighten up or you're going to shovel coal for the rest of your life in the pits of hell. It's not just benefit, which is positive thinking or possibility thinking or uh, the prosperity gospel. It's not primarily emulation, which is the ploy of many to imitate the few entertainers or athletes who may be Christians. It's not primarily becoming a part of the culture, which might be okay if our culture were really Christian. But even a cursory perusal of the daily news adds to that long litany of evidence that even if it ever was, our culture hardly reflects the best of Christian faith. Our response to Christ and thus to God can only be love. And Jesus says here that those who love me will keep my word. That's what I was telling the children a while ago is what's turning our faith on and making it work. That seems to be a fairly simple idea but it can be at times diluted by what passes for religion. It was not too, too long ago that Robert Tilton appeared again on Christian television. He and the others who pander the prosperity gospel are trying to sell, literally, the peace that the world gives. Uh, I ran across an old article from the Dallas Morning News in the days when the Word of Faith Family Church was in full swing and having full power, that assurance that religion was sweeping over the land up there in Farmersville or, no, Farmers Branch, I think that's where, Farmersville is another place. Anyway, here's what the article said. I, I kept it because it, it, I thought I could use it for an occasion such as this for a sermon illustration. He <laughs> says, what finally prompted me to write was from last Sunday's service at Word of Faith. Reverend Don Clowers was preaching the usual sermon on how Jesus died for our wallets. He quoted from the 23rd Psalm, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I was reading that word green, brother, brother Clower said, and I got to thinking about dollar bills, and the congregation whooped and applauded. Then I got to thinking about five dollar bills, and then I got to thinking about twenty dollar bills, and then thinking about hundred dollar bills. And to the congregation's delight, Clowers pulled out a roll of money from his pocket, and he began scattering bills all over the chancel and he got down on his hands and knees and just wallowed in the moolah. And, oh yeah, he shouted, I want to be in the green, Lord. The writer of the article concluded, tongue in cheek, 
uh, I'm just afraid that some people may call that silly, if not blasphemy. Well, that same message is still being proclaimed in some places every Sunday, if in more sophisticated ways. Now, please understand, these references are not made to defame some variation on the traditional Christian faith. This is not a variation. It has nothing to do with the gospel. The text from John that we're looking at this morning is a case in point. I wonder, have you ever noticed that we live in a society that seems drunk with excess? Uh, we've supersized our food portion sizes and our bodies with them. We've supersized our cars, although uh, the spiral of fuel prices may bring that into review. And we supersized our houses. Who wants to be a millionaire ran its course and then it returned as who wants to be a super millionaire? And you know they've upped the lottery to try to revive interest so that the billboards now have the Powerball winnings in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The newest rides at Six Flags are even more extreme and jerk you around a little bit more than the old ones. And some try to baptize all of that with scripture in the name of relevance. Nobody who has had and who exercises much intelligence when, replied, when applied to the whole gospel will take much of that business seriously. But the often not too subtle message is without the world's treasures, which seems valid only in escalating extremity, life is nothing and God has not blessed. And Jesus is saying to those whose world was about to be literally turned upside down, who never would have much of worldly wealth, who would die martyr's death, he says to them, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So the theme is love. It's still love. But this particular gospel passage defines it as our love for God. The definition is tied to obedience. If we love God, then we keep his word. It is an act of obedience that a relationship establishes a relationship with God. It is an act of obedience that nourishes that relationship. And without a disposition to keep his word, any sense of meaningful relationship with God is difficult, if not impossible. It's not a matter of whether God loves us. That's always a given. But whether we can sense and experience that love. So the first resource that we're always going to, to bring out is love. The second resource is the promise of support. The disciples were to be separated from Christ as they had known him, but it didn't mean that they would be alone. They would have some memories, but there would be more than just memories. There's a living presence. He said to them, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Notice that, he, that you don't have to do anything beyond keeping the word to get the Spirit. God sends that. The Spirit will teach you everything and will remind you of all I have said. We believe that Jesus' words are preserved through the activity of the Holy Spirit. It establishes that Jesus is the standard for all revelations about God and God's will. There's one other resource and that resource is a result, peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Well, what is the big thing about peace? Well, where you have people in the news week after week that are going into places and they shoot up whether it's a grocery store or a school or a post office or whatever it is and then take their own life, that, my friends, is somebody that doesn't know much about peace. So you're gonna have to be if life is gonna mean anything. Peace is the final result of loving Christ and the coming of the Spirit into a life. Well, what is peace? A colleague of mine said to me the other day, I looked at the news before church this morning and I wondered how I could preach. And then I looked over my sermon, I was to preach and I remembered that God is God. God is over this world. God makes love real in acts of self-giving. God is bigger than the news. And that's good news. And again, Jesus' peace is different from the world's peace. The world's peace is based on some difficult things. The world's peace is based on the idea that things are going my way or things are going exactly as expected. Well, neither poverty or want or pain have any glory in them. They are not the ideal of Christian discipleship. We would do well to eliminate them from our lives, from our society, and from the world. But the call is to eliminate these things from all lives, not just ours. The peace that Christ gives is independent from benefits in this life. Neither pleasure or pain or gain or loss creates or annuls the peace of God. Those who, like the Apostle John in Revelation, peek beyond the fading glory of this life and in that great, and I don't know whether the the majesty of that image that he gave as the book of Revelation was read. But in that eternal city of God, we see a symbol of the fulfillment of our deepest longings. The old television series, Cheers, is in perpetual reruns there. You can see it almost on any day and at most days of many different times of the day. Cheers is the legendary bar in Boston. It's owned by an ex-baseball player named Sam Malone. Sam has a lucky bottle cap and he lends that bottle cap to a young aspiring up-and-coming ball player. The young player then begins and continues to have amazing success. Now Sam is desperate to get his lucky bottle cap back, but the young man seems reluctant to give it. You see, Sam is a recovering alcoholic, and the cap is from the last drink that he took. He believes this bottle cap is the thing that has kept him from drinking for the all of the years that he's been sober. Well, the, fine, the young baseball player finally confesses that it's not that he's unwilling to part with the bottle cap, but the fact is he had lost it several weeks ago, shortly after Sam lent it to him. What is a bottle cap good for? Well, for Sam Malone, it was a symbol it was a symbol to keep him from being his worst self. And back to our original question, what is Christian faith good for? Well, for those who hold it fast, it not only keeps us from the depths of being our worst self, but it gives us power to become our best selves. 
it gives us power to be what God created in us to be. But this faith is more than a symbol. It is born of a disposition and a decision to keep Christ's word. It is empowered by the presence of a living spirit. And it results in a peace that stands above the fortunes of life in a fickle world. Until that day when God carries us away to some high mountain. And along with the Apostle John we too get to live in peace in that holy city at last. Thanks be to God. Will you now stand and let us join together in our affirmation of faith using these compiled words of scripture as we have them. This is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved if we hold it fast. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, then to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated. And now we come and Kevin comes to lead us in a time of recognition of two graduating seniors. If I could get Kevin and Connor to come up front with me so I can embarrass, I mean, introduce you. You guys clean up pretty good. Usually I get to see them when we're going on mission trips and that sort of thing, and, and uh, they're, they're a little bit less than uh, dressed up. But uh, no, I got uh, Kevin Gordon, Connor Como, our graduating seniors from high school this year, and we'd like to recognize them a little bit. They are a little bit, I'm a little jealous, you guys in high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, in high school, you know, when I was in high school, we just went to school. These guys got to do stuff. So Connor did welding. You did culinary arts, right? And so they've already done fun stuff. And they did that in high school, right? Do, do any of that. Now, culinary arts is kind of where you're headed for your future, right? Yeah. What you're going to study? Hospitality management. So it's like restaurant and hotel management. Yeah. What's your, what's your go-to meal that you cook? What's it? You get asked to cook something. What is it? A sandwich. <laughs> I can do a sandwich, and I didn't go to school. <laughs> and you're going to the University of you're following your older brother to the University of Arkansas, is that correct? Yes, sir. That's the plan? Okay. All right, now, the next question is, you've got Gordon Ramsey, who's on TV and all that kind of stuff, Kevin Gordon, kind of the same thing. We're going to see you on TV? No. no. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> now, Connor, you've got to do welding. Right? And that's kind of your plan in the future is to get into welding school and, and do that? What's, yeah. your, what's your biggest welding uh, thing that you got to do in high school? Um, like like project-wise? Yeah. Or, um, re there wasn't really like much projects, but uh, I guess just he had, he had us doing some trailers. Trailers? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Now, do you have your own equipment yet? Uh, but you could do welding if somebody gave you the equipment. Yeah. All right. All right, so they're off to do their thing. So in recognition, we've got a little gift for them, for each one. We wish you all the very best as you head off into the real world, away from mom and dad. Not quite yet away from mom and dad. You've got to look after dad a little bit, don't you? Yeah. You've got to kind of work. My big question is, when you work with him, do you really do do the work and he sits in the car drinks coffee or um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right we wish you all the best look at the poster did you see the poster out there I did, yes. yeah did you make the poster no huh? did you see your poster out there I didn't see it. you didn't see it you didn't did you make your poster my mom did yeah. thank you mom thanks mom <laughs>
Thank you, Mom. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> go check them out. They're pretty cool. All right. Mom did a good job. Let us pray for you before you go. May God, who began his good work in you, carry it through to completion, enabling you to use your talents to the fullest. May God give you the grace to make wise choices and to be faithful to your commitments always confident in the support of those who love you. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you will live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you will work for justice, equality, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you will reach out your hand to comfort them and change their pain into joy. May God bless you with the foolishness to think that you can make a difference in the world so that you will do the things which others tell you cannot be done. May your integrity be a gift to the world. And may the Spirit of God be with you always. For we pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we continue our prayers, will you pray with me? Loving God, you care for all your children. You know each one. You hear each prayer. You know each house. And you see each need. Give peace and love to all who call upon you and hear the concerns that we lay before you. We pray your blessing upon this congregation and upon all who gathered in your spirit, confirm us in the faith of the gospel, inspire us with love for your house, zeal in your service, and joy in the well-being of your kingdom. We pray for our nation, guide those who hold offices of public trust, govern their hearts and minds that principle may triumph over a quest for power that they may fulfill their service for the welfare of the people they govern. Give us a will to listen to one another, that we may glimpse into each other's reality, and cast out hatred and malice among us, and let us squash the disdain of human life. We pray for the people of Buffalo, especially those who are victims of racism, and in so many places that have been shattered by random killing. Bless the whole world with peace. Kindle in the hearts of all people the love of peace. Show the leaders of nations the folly of vain ambition that destroys and hurts and kills. We pray for continued fortitude and courage among the people of Ukraine. Guide all leaders with your wisdom that your kingdom may advance until the earth be filled with the knowledge of your love. Bless with your comfort all who are in trouble or pain. Heal those who are sick. Support and comfort those who are dying or those who mourn a loss. Supply the wants of those who are in need and show us how to be agents of your love in fulfilling some of those needs. As we remember those who are victims of weather, who are in the path of runaway fires, those for whom there has been too little or too much rain, for those in Africa who live under want that has come from famine, hear now in our silence the names and concerns that lie deep within us. Eternal God, you create us by your power and redeem us by your love. 
guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves in love and service to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us when we pray to say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, great God, for the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We praise you for his presence with us. Because he lives, we look for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is 720.
out all of it, why not turn on the wind of the Holy Spirit so it may blow and change and bless this earth even a little bit through you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.